This video was sponsored by Skillshare. Ever since Nokia sold its phone business to Microsoft about five years ago, European companies have essentially disappeared from the smartphone industry. But in the 40th episode of the Story Behind series, I'd like to argue that European companies are finally starting to make a comeback, even if it's a pretty modest one for now. Europe used to be a frontrunner in mobile phones. Nokia at its peak sold over 450 million devices, which is more than even Samsung sold at its peak, and many European tech giants like French Alcatel, German Siemens, and Swedish Ericsson were serious mobile phone makers too. That was until Alcatel sold its handset business to Chinese TCL in 2005, Siemens sold its mobile business to Taiwanese BenQ the same year, Ericsson sold its stake in the Sony Ericsson joint venture to Japanese Sony in 2012, and just one year later Nokia 2 sold its phone business to American Microsoft. In just a few years, these titans of the mobile phone world were gone from Europe, supplanted by more aggressive and nimble players from the rest of the world. And with them moved much of the expertise in making and selling phones as well. US companies now control all major mobile operating systems, while Asians have built unparalleled capabilities in designing and especially manufacturing hardware. It's a tough landscape for would-be European companies when they can't significantly impact software and they can't possibly innovate as rapidly and as cheaply on hardware as their Asian competitors. But after a long period of drought, I think there's a couple of European companies who are starting to figure a way around this. I've actually interviewed five of the most interesting companies and studied many of the others and realized that there are three distinct strategies European companies have adopted. The first, and in my opinion, least interesting one is the one that I'll call the regional champion strategy. French Wico and Spanish BQ are the two companies I talk to, but there's also Wiley Fox from the UK and a few others. And uh, French here is in quotation marks for Wico as they were recently acquired by their Chinese manufacturing partner, but let's leave them in the conversation for now. So both of these companies make very standard, affordable phones, but unlike others, they focus on just a few markets. Hence why I call them regional champions. Not a complicated strategy, but it seems to work because both companies I've talked to sell phones in the millions, BQ is actually showing healthy growth figures, and both claim to be profitable, which is more than the mobile divisions of companies like Sony, LG, and HTC can say about themselves. Their most expensive devices cost 3 and 400 euros respectively, and they both run stock Android for the most part, although BQ has a few cool perks for geeks on top of that. BQ was the first phone maker to release an Android One device in a developed market. They also had a Ubuntu phone as well as a Cyanogen OS device, and unlike most manufacturers, they're even quite speedy at publishing their kernel source codes to GitHub. So all in all, pretty cool. The BQ Aquarius X2 and X2 Pro review units they gave me are definitely solid phones for the price, but just like the Wico phones, they're also somehow just standard. The key strategic advantage that these brands have is that instead of having to build and maintain a global brand like Sony, LG and others through expensive global marketing campaigns, sales channels and customer support systems, regional champions concentrate their resources on just a few markets where they achieve a pretty good position. Wico claims to be number two in France, BQ is number three in Spain, and both have a somewhat dominant position in a few other European markets too. It's much cheaper to acquire a good mindshare in just a few markets, so they can undercut global brands like LG and Sony on price and still make a profit. Now, this is a solid strategy against classic brands like the ones we've already talked about, but I'm not sure how well it's gonna work against more aggressive players like Xiaomi, for example. Just like in India, where an aggressive tidal wave of Chinese companies have pretty much completely destroyed the regional champions of India, I'm afraid the same will happen to the European versions of these companies as well, because they don't have very strong brands, they don't have very differentiated products, so the only thing they can fight on is price, and that against Xiaomi will be very difficult. Now, I wish them good luck, especially BQ, who apparently designs hardware, develops software, and even manufactures some of the hardware, such as their 3D printers, in Spain. That's a rare thing, and I would hate to see that go away. Okay, I'll call Type 2 the niche brand strategy, and it's a little more viable in my opinion. Fairphone and Block are probably the best examples of the strategy, and the trick here is that, unlike regional champions, these companies have a very unique niche product that has no direct competitors for now. 
Amsterdam-based Fairphone makes a phone that is modular, easy to repair, and has as little negative impact on the environment and the people in their supply chain as possible. You know, as many conflict-free materials as possible, no child labor, you get the point. Berlin-based Block has pretty standard hardware, but develops really unique software for it. I'll have an exclusive, in-depth video about Block OS once it gets a little more polished, so subscribe if you want to see that, but in short, they have completely customized Android to make it as distraction-free and as non-addictive as possible. I like the idea behind both of these companies, they're unique, and for now, they don't have very direct competitors. And a niche product is a high risk, high return strategy. It's high risk because nobody knows if sustainable devices or distraction free Android software is something that people actually want. And even if it is, it's unclear whether these companies can actually build the stuff that they have envisioned. Block OS is a cool concept and the team has made some great progress, but it's still far from the universal solution that Block envisions for the future. That is still years of hard work away and success isn't exactly guaranteed. In the same way, Fairphone has had unimpressive sales results in the last few years because they just couldn't produce phones fast enough with their complicated manufacturing processes and supply chain. So these companies are highly risky, but of course the return is also pretty high because they don't have a lot of direct competitors right now, which means that the prices they can charge are also pretty high. Case in point, the latest Fairphone that has specs straight out of 2014 costs 529 euros. Plus Fairphone also makes money from selling components. The price of the newest block phone at 359 euros is much more reasonable, but still above what you'd pay for similar hardware from the likes of BQ and Wiko. Doing something unique allows companies to have decent margins. As I said, high risk, high return. So the regional champion and the niche brand strategies are both focused on a particular niche, either a regional one or a product one. And none of these companies can go fully mainstream because just like other European smartphone makers as well, they have very limited control over both the software and the hardware of their devices. But there is one European company who has a chance at going fully mainstream, I think. The Nokia strategy is the last on my list and believe it or not, it is unique to Nokia. The formula is actually quite simple. The Nokia brand name is so beloved and has such a nostalgia factor that even if all the company behind it does is create solid phones and sells them at reasonable prices, lots of consumers will want to buy them, the biggest retailers will want to stock them, the richest investors will want to fund them, the smartest people will want to become their employees, the biggest manufacturing partners will want to produce their phones, and yes, lots of YouTubers like me will give them free publicity by talking about them. The Nokia brand is still incredibly valuable. So so HMD, the Finnish startup behind the brand's revival, has a huge opportunity to turn Nokia into a mainstream global brand. The trick is that they need to get to a large scale before the nostalgia and the oh Nokia is back factor wears off. And so far they have done very well. They have sold about 10 million phones in their first year of existence and it seems like they'll do around twice as much next year. They are already in the global top 10 and in Europe they're even in the top 5, comfortably surpassing brands like Sony and HTC in most major markets. They have established themselves in Europe, China, India and a few more key markets and they have a full portfolio of devices. All of that in a little more than a year. All they do for now is building solid phones with Android One and selling them at reasonable prices, but it seems like the Nokia brand and the very aggressive management team who knows that they have to expand as fast as possible before the nostalgia factor wears off is working very well for them so far. I think they will soon have to start investing into differentiating their products because even though I like their phones, I use the 7 Plus on a daily basis, if they don't have differentiated products, I doubt the growth will continue for very long. If HMD can innovate something meaningful though, I think they have a chance at making Nokia a global household brand again in just a couple of years. And as a European, I'd really like to see that. Inheriting something as valuable as the Nokia brand name is like finding a cheat code in a video game. If you aren't lucky enough to find your own cheat code in life, then developing unique skills like niche brands do is your best chance of standing out from the crowd. And the easiest way to acquire your own new skills is by going to Skillshare. 
They have over 20,000 classes in design, photography, finance, marketing, and whatever you can think of. And my favorite one lately is this course on how to make animated YouTube videos from my friend Evan, who runs the very successful Polymeter YouTube channel. It explains his process from the beginning to the end, including researching, writing, and animating. And it's so good that even I learned a few tricks from it, even though he's kind of explaining my job. So if you want to learn how to make animated videos or acquire any other skill, use the link in the description, which gives you two months of free premium access and really helps my channel out as well.